Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Well, I looked all over for a bolo tie to wear tonight because um, this is really a New Mexico event, this book. Um, Gwyneth Cravens grew up there, and Rip Anderson has worked there all his life. They got to be friends, and uh, they were on opposite sides of nuclear issues and probably others as well. And whose mind got changed was not Rip's, it was Gwyneth's. <laughs> uh, and she has spent half a decade working up a book which comes out later this month. You can order it now from Amazon. There's a cover out in the table in the lobby um, called Power to Save the World. And it happened to be sent to me for a blurb, which I, I did. And I did that and I invited them to speak here because it's such a damn good book. Basically, it gets away from a lot of the hand-waving on both sides that you see around nuclear and goes right into the, the guts of the matter. And uh, that's why I was hoping that they could come and, and they agreed to even before they go on the road show for the, for the book. So please welcome The Guts of the Matter, Gwyneth and Rip. <laughs> Hi, I'm the writer, and here's my Virgil in the nuclear world, uh, D. Richard Anderson, or RIP as we call him. Um, first of all, I want to thank Stuart Brand for inviting us to speak. After an article about him appeared in the New York Times, a retired nuclear engineer wrote a letter to the editor saying, quote, the nuclear industry and the environmental movement need each other in order to arrive at the common goal of environmentally acceptable energy generation on a large scale. Kudos to Stuart Brand for helping to bridge the gap between the two, unquote. Because of Stuart, we have now all seen the picture of the whole Earth. There's not really an environmentalist Earth and a nuclear power Earth. There's just one planet. The poet Rumi said, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. That's what my hope is and rips too. We hope that people in the environmental milieu and members of the nuclear world can come together to face the immense challenge that is upon us. We need to put aside assumptions and look at facts. As Marie Curie said, Nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we fear less. About 10 years ago at a party in Albuquerque, my hometown, I fell into a conversation with Rip about nuclear power. He and his wife, Marcia Fernandez, who is over there handling the slides, uh, Marcia's a <clears throat> community activist and educator, and they have an organic sustainable farm near the Rio Grande. Rip's day job is as a scientist, but he has another job. He's also a beekeeper, and here he is in what looks like a nuclear decontamination suit, but it's really a beekeeper's outfit, rescuing a hive. Um, while thinking globally, Rip and Marcia work hard locally to preserve clean air, the aquifer, and open land. They rescued a 10-acre former airfield from the threat of development and rounded up volunteers from the community and uh, sowed grain, planted trees, uh, and pretty soon they had a wildlife sanctuary. Those are cattle egrets, not migrating cranes, actually. Um, if you want to learn about Rip's youth as a cowboy uh, in the rodeo and on the range, uh, or his dive into a reactor, and how he became a theoretical chemist and oceanographer, and an internationally known expert on risk assessment and environmental health and nuclear safety, you'll just have to read the book. But back to that conversation we had at the party. He happened to mention that a lot of our nuclear warheads are now being dismantled and their cores will be turned into fuel for nuclear plants. He said 10% of our electricity already comes from 
former Soviet warheads. That surprised me. And the, the surprise just was beginning. I didn't know that then. Until that evening, most of what I knew about nuclear energy had come from organizations that opposed nuclear power. I'd marched to ban the bomb in Greenwich Village, and by the way, would march again today in a minute to ban the bomb. And later on, I protested the opening of Shoreham, a nuclear plant on Long Island. I wouldn't do that again. In addition to writing literary fiction and the occasional science article, I've been a contributor to various liberal and left publications and a magazine editor as well. I'm an organic gardener too, and a member of a sustainable organic community farm in Eastern Long Island. Um, when Rip spoke favorably about nuclear power that night, I was annoyed. And I think those of you in the audience who are in the nuclear world are probably familiar with that irritated tone that uh, someone will take uh, in a social event at you. But the dialogue continued each time I saw him because he kept referring to the long term, to the big picture, to what the overall risks and benefits are. I saw that he thought uh, on a big scale and in terms of thousands of years. He also spoke about catastrophic climate change. He said, we're heating up the planet because of the sources of energy we choose. People get trapped by short-term thinking and narrow focus. He emphasized the importance of objective, science-based, peer-reviewed information, whether the topic is global warming or nuclear power. He told me that the same probabilistic risk assessment that gives us a portrait of what we can expect from rising temperatures is also used to analyze nuclear safety. Yes, but was usually my response. I brought up various nuclear disaster scenarios. He provided many explanations and invoked laws of physics. Finally, he said, why don't we visit the nuclear world and you can see for yourself? So he and Marsha and I went on the Nuclear America tour. It took a lot of inquiry and fact-checking to change my mind. We'll give you some of the highlights. As we go along, some of you will be thinking, yes, but, as Stuart said, there'll be a Q&A after the talk, so you can tell us your yes buts then, or no but, no and. Because of Rip's fear about the long-term impacts from burning fossil fuels, and now mine, tonight we want to talk about how nuclear power can be a major part of the solution in the coming decades and centuries. We'll talk about the overall picture of the resources we have to make electricity, the increasing need for it, and the risks and benefits of different forms of energy generation now and in the future. We're lucky in this society to have a lot of choices. But Rip, when it comes to electricity production, how many options do we really have? Glenn, we only really have three uh, options for base load electrical energy. They are hydro, fossil fuels, and nuclear. I need to stop for just a second and explain what I mean by base load. Base load is the capacity of the electrical industry to instantaneously supply you or me with 24 seven electricity on demand. And that means that you have to have a, an instantaneous way of generating additional electricity when the demand goes up. Turns out that solar and geothermal and a wind cannot do that. It, on, it only can be done by hydro, by fossil fuels, and by nuclear. Okay, so uh, that narrows it down tonight to talking about nuclear power to, some ex to a great extent anyway. When nuclear plants are shut down, they're replaced by fossil fuel plants, not wind or solar or con conservation. For example, uh, Germany uh, decided to phase out nuclear power. And uh, they've started plans to build 26 new conventional coal-fired plants. If they hew to this plan and phase out nuclear and build more coal plants, 
despite the impressive wind and solar installations in the country, greenhouse gas emissions will rise there. But it sounds like they're backing off on the uh, nuclear plant shutdown. Um, Okay, this is projected energy use in coming years. There's been increased in efficiency and better conservation methods uh, that have been coming along very nicely, especially in the industrial sector for 20 or 30 years. But the private sector has lagged behind in terms of conservation and uh, efficiency. The digital revolution and fancy new electronics and appliances and bigger homes uh, suck up a lot of electricity. Uh, then there are the developing nations that really desperately need more electricity. In places without it, the average lifespan is 43 years. Bringing even a few watts to a village increases survival. At the present rate, electricity will probably double by, uh, uh, electricity demand will probably double by 2030, as you can see from the 2030 slot up over there. We must be vigilant about wastefulness, but conservation alone uh, is just a finite resource. We have to actually provide more power. And so we're on the cusp of a big choice here as a society. If we continue the way we have, fossil fuels are going to be providing most of that new electricity. If you look at the amount of electricity that's generated in the United States, you will see that coal generates about 39, gas 19, oil 7, hydro 16, nuclear 17, and all of the others are about 2%. If you look at this circle, you will notice that in essence, all except the hydro are the, the energy is generated by burning something. Could I have the next slide? I don't want to make this look silly, but really what every one of those do is boil water, the water turns a turbine, the turbine swings magnets through a field and generates the power that you and I want to uh, use. So in essence, everything is boiling water. I can get the paperwork here. Could I have the next slide? From this figure, you will see that, uh, that there is different amounts of, of material generating different kilowatt hours of electricity. The real point here is that seven grams, approximately the size of a pencil eraser of uranium oxide, will generate a lot of energy, comparing one a uh, kilogram of oil for four kilowatt hours and one kilogram of uranium for 50,000 kilowatt hours of, of energy. The next slide. This is a detailed slide. The real thing that I want to, to, for you to pick from this slide is that uranium uh, pellets and the nuclear fuel cycle is a very, very concentrated energy source way more concentrated than any other source that we have available to us. Let's talk a little bit about greenhouse gases um, from worldwide electricity production. You can see here uh, the red uh, indicates direct emissions from power sources, the white the indirect emissions from the, life, the comprehensive life cycle which includes mining and waste disposal and all of that. So you can see that coal uh, goes way up. It's the big killer. And on the other end, nuclear, you can barely see. Uh, its range is between tw 21 and 9 uh, grams of carbon dioxide per, uh, or CO2 equivalent uh, per kilowatt hour. So. Uh, Nuclear power actually is, uh, has lower emissions in terms of greenhouse gases than wind, and certainly lower than solar. 
Okay. Um, to give you an idea about the volume of waste from coal as compared to nuclear waste, this is a picture of the beautiful Sandia Mountains above Albuquerque. And uh, they're about a, a mile and a quarter high above the city. Uh, fossil fuel combustion produces 27 billion tons of carbon dioxide yearly in, in the world. If you, if it was solidified, it would make a mountain of the size of the Sandias there, and with a base of over six miles in circumference. Um, the same quantity of energy provided by nuclear fuel would produce only 14,000 tons of solid waste. It would occupy a cube that was about 18 yards on a side, about the volume of a big townhouse. The waste is always shielded and isolated from the public. And of course, as we saw, there's no the gaseous waste is negligible with nuclear. Uh, okay, if you got all of your energy, all of your electricity for your entire life, about 77 years is the average lifespan in America, then your share of the waste would fit in one Coke can. If you got all of your electricity just from coal, instead of the 51% on average we're getting in this country, uh, over your life, you would be responsible for 69 tons of solid waste and 77 tons of CO2. And you can see that it would take the, all those railroad cars to haul your waste around. So can we go back one a slide? Thanks. Um, so there's uh, the story. The, uh, Coal waste statistics are so staggering that when you begin to learn about them, you don't know why people aren't out marching about this and picketing and demanding coal plants be shut down. Uh, and of course we can't because we're totally addicted to them. We're dependent on that base load electricity. Uh, but the solid waste from coal combustion contains arsenic, mercury, lead, and uh, other toxins. Don't uh, forget uranium. Oh, I was going to get to that. It also, also contains uranium, thorium, radium, and we'll be talking about that a little more later. Uh, and so our share of the waste at present is 890 pounds per year per American. The total amount of waste uh, from coal combustion uh, would take a million uh, railroad cars to ha uh, haul it, and that the train made of those railroad cars would be 9,600 miles long, over three times the distance between New York and LA. What we also don't see about coal combustion is what it's doing to public health. It's not uh, high drama for, you know, you don't see a TV, made for TV scary movie about coal combustion, but it's scary. And, uh, oh, by the way, this is a coal train, uh, if you've, in case you've never seen one or had to wait at a railroad crossing out west for an hour while it goes by. Um, so the next thing um, is the health impacts of coal, which are quite worrisome. Uh, you can see that around 24,000 people die a year from power plant pollution in the United States, and that's chiefly coal. Um, you know, there's some natural gas and some oil, but really, it, they're talking about coal here. Uh, in China, over 400,000 deaths a year from coal pollution, uh, which you're now receiving here in California, coal pollution. Richard Rhodes, uh, author of Making of the Atomic Bomb, has written, the World Health Organization has estimated that indoor and outdoor air pollution from fossil fuel burning causes some three million deaths per year worldwide, substituting small sequestered volumes of nuclear waste for vast dispersed volumes of toxic waste from fossil fuels would be an improvement in public health so obvious that it is astonishing that physicians throughout the world have not demanded such a conversion. Global warming, it's 
to me, one of the biggest challenges that man has ever faced. In the first, it's the first time man has been, has the capability of doing something that can impact the total earth. In 1960, when I was studying oceanography, I was really concerned about it, but at that point in time, it was only a theory. Now I'm convinced that global warming is real. And what we're really arguing about is how hard or how high the temperature that global warming uh, will, will occur over the next while. In addition, I'm very, very worried about the negative effects of Earth of that in addition to the temperature increase. I'm worried about the fact that carbon dioxide, when it dissolves in the ocean, generates carbonic acid and carbonic acid dissolves any carbonate shells of any species in the ocean. So it will eliminate many of the uh, critters that we eat and enjoy watching, like coral, oysters, and, and clams. But even more importantly, when the, when the ocean, which is now basic, but changing slightly in pH values in, 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 in acidity, when it becomes acid, it will no longer act as the, ma uh, the huge sponge for sucking up CO2 that it is now, and it won't suck up any more to CO2. Therefore, it, the, uh, the thermal or global warming will be accelerated. And it, I think we're heading for a very, very large problem, both in acidification of the ocean and in just increasing the temperature of our globe. Um, those greenhouse uh, gases are mitigated uh, in a, to a huge extent by nuclear power, which accounts for 71 percent of greenhouse gas-free electricity in the United States. It's the single largest displacer of greenhouse gases in the world, and is likely to be so for a long time to come. Uh, it can and must replace fossil fuel as base load. Of course, we'll need all the things we, all the other solutions we can get, like um, solar, you know, whatever solar power can do, and wind power, and geothermal, and tidal. These are all part of the deal. But the heavy lifting is going to have to be done. The greenhouse gas-free heavy lifting will have to be done by nuclear if we're going to try to uh, save ourselves from the scenario Rip is talking about. We're about to get to the Nuclear America tour, but first let's talk a bit about radiation exposure. I needed to know about that before I was willing to go to nuclear facilities. Um, like, I tended not to distinguish high radiation, high dose radiation of the kind that people suffered from in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and the uh, firefighters and emergency workers at Chernobyl. I didn't distinguish that from the low-dose radi radiation that we get and we even emit in everyday life. There's a lot of ignorance about low-dose radiation and uh, f fears that are completely unwarranted. Uh, we evolved in an ocean of radiation that was actually much more intense than it is today. The ocean of natural radiation is deeper in some places than others. Salt beds, for example, have extremely low natural radioactivity. And then there are parts of the world, like uh, part, a part of Iran, where the, the, there's a lot of radium in the soil and the water, and it's very highly radioactive. And parts of Brazil and India and China, where people live quite healthy lives, by the way. Um, most of our exposure, uh, human exposure, uh, from natural background is from radon that uh, comes out of rocks uh, like uranium and thorium. And uh, also the sea, sea water is actually uh, high in uranium content, which washes off the continents and into the ocean. And then there's cosmic radiation from you know, uh, the solar system and the universe, uh, which is greater at higher altitudes. 
to understand uh, the reference here, a millirem is a measure of the biological damage to living tissue from radiation exposure. Below 10,000 millirem, there is no scientific basis for con confirming whether damage occurs or not. Uh, they, it's just very hard to know the effects of uh, low-dose radiation because of all the noise, as it were, of natural background radiation. Uh, so right now, uh, a lot of our uh, regulations about radiation have to do with estimates. Uh, the science is really not there. Recent uh, research on low-dose uh, radiation has found that it can stimulate DNA repair mechanism. So uh, this shows how we evolved, you know, that, that radiation actually played a role in our, our, the way our DNA developed and helps our immune system. Uh, and this is a very tantalizing subject and a controversial one and obviously deserves more uh, research. The panel on the biological effects of ionizing radiation has called for more low-dose research. Uh, that, that panel establishes or upholds standards and advises uh, Congress and so on on how to promulgate the right level of radiation standards. There's a campaign among radiation biologists around the world to establish an ultra-low-dose laboratory to get really solid facts from carefully controlled studies in a, a very low background radiation uh, setting uh, half a mile under the ground in a salt bed. And we're going to talk more about that very interesting salt bed later. Uh, then we have all sources of radiation. Uh, this graphic, which I uh, like so much, uh, is actually now out of date. Um, the Com National Committee on Radiation Protection announced in July that medical radiation, uh, the average dose per American, is... Um, about the same as natural background radiation, 300 millirem a year average for medical radiation, and on average 300 millirem a year for natural background. So you can see uh, that there are different types of radiation, uh, and um, I just want to talk a little about where they come from. Uh, food, for example, is one way we uh, take in radiation from nature uh, by eating uh, isotopes. There are isotopes in foods. And uh, therefore, we emit low-dose radiation because of radioisotopes in the food we eat. So um, here are some, uh, and the, the thing to know about this chart, uh, this graphic, is that Radiation has different penetrating power. So you can hold a piece of plutonium in your hand on a piece of paper, as RIP has done, and the rays coming out of the plutonium don't even penetrate the paper. And uh, the skin stops them, too. But others, uh, like beta and gamma, are more penetrating in neutrons. But you can see that they're all stopped by concrete. And concrete uh, plays a very big role in the nuclear world, as you're going to hear. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, show you some things in daily life that are radioactive. Uh, for starters, a salt substitute, which in radiation protection classes they now use instead of a radioactive source like americium or plutonium or something, no salt will set off a Geiger counter. Uh, Brazil nuts. Uh, the ones that are from Brazil are grown in the thorium soils, and they, uh, a, a radiation biologist I know, uses Brazil nuts to calibrate his Geiger counter. <laughs> and um, cigarettes, if you smoke two packs a day of cigarettes, then in one year you have a dose to your lungs of 8,000 to 20,000 millirem. So every person in the nuclear world that I, and I interviewed a lot of people, and I would say, well, how, how can a person avoid excess radiation? And I thought they might say, well, shut down nuclear plants or something like that. They said, to a man and woman, don't smoke. 
And then this uh, beautiful orange plate is Fiesta Ware, which will also set off a Geiger counter. Uh, we couldn't find a Geiger counter that clicked. Rip, Rip has one, but it doesn't click, and so it's no fun. But uh, this is uh, radioactive. And then bananas. Uh, 0.01 millirem for every time you eat a banana. And uh, a nuclear power plant, uh, if you live next to it for a year, they estimate, because it's so tiny they can't really tell, that your exposure is 0 0.009 millirem in a year. So uh, some people in the nuclear world like to rate things in banana years. <laughs> so something to think about if you like bananas as much as I do is you're really, you know, sucking up the radiation. Uh, okay, so I stopped worrying about excess radiation exposure. But then one day we were, Rip and I were talking, and he was talking about reactors, and I said, you know, they're really unnatural. This is not uh, something humans should be. It's something humans have brought into uh, the world. Uh, we didn't have this before, now we have this terrible thing to deal with, uh, reactors. He replied that there were reactors in nature, Mother Nature's reactors. And I could not believe that. I thought, uh, as in the early days with Rip, every now and then I would thought, is he pulling my leg, or is he a little nuts, or something like that. So I would always look up everything he told me. Well, I looked up natural reactors, and I found out about the Oklo natural reactors in Gabon, West Africa. Starting around two billion years ago in a river delta in, uh, uh, called the Oklo, uh, 16 reactors, natural reactors, produced power at about the t 100 kilowatt level for about 150 million years. Well, Rip, what was your secret? To be honest with you, I did every once in a while pull her leg just to see if she was paying attention, and almost <laughs> always she was. The Gabon reactor is a very interesting one. In fact, there are uh, tw uh, 12 of them now that they have found throughout the United or throughout the globe, and I'm sure as they look into other geologic formations, they will find others. In many geologic formations which contain uranium, the conditions were just right to allow the chain reaction that occurs in a reactor to occur. There was sufficient amount of uranium, of the right kind, of course. There was water to carry away the heat, and they ran for a long period of time. And what happened at the end of that time? They ran out of fuel and they stopped. The, the unstable atoms that were being burned were finally gone, and they left the radionuclides, some of them, and some stable atoms there, which was the key to the uh, French experimentalists that found the first one that said, one, it was a reactor, two, it ran for a long period of time, and three, most of the fission fragments, the radionuclides, never moved out of the ge geologic formation, which was the first natural proof that that geologic formations really do contain radioactivity. Well, when we talk about the Gabon reactor, we have to start back and say, what is a chain reaction? And a chain, oh, what is radioactive decay? First, I jumped over a slide. Radioactive decay is, in effect, an unstable atom breaking apart in some way, giving off particles, radiation, and a lot of heat, of course. And that heat, then, it can be used if you can figure out how to trap it. And the next slide, then, is what is a nuclear chain reaction? A nuclear chain reaction is when a, a neutron from one unstable atom flies out and hits another unstable atom and breaks it apart. And that chain continues until all of the uh, unstable atoms have been used up or enough neutrons escape without hitting an unstable atom that the chain reaction stops. Next slide. How does a reactor work? 
Well, by now with that crazy cartoon up front, you probably know. It, the unstable atoms break apart, being hit by neutrons and, and causing others to break apart, and that energy boils water. And the water is cycled through the appropriate uh, 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 tool to generate the electricity, and, and uh, the electricity goes out on the wires. Glenn? Um, well, I just want to talk a little bit on the nuclear tour. We started out at the, uh, looking at the cradle of uranium in the United States. Uh, it really starts out in the sun, uh, or in, uh, rather in a supernova. Uh, supernovae make uranium atoms, but uh, we went to uh, a Ambrosia Lake in New Mexico and um, looked at what was sort of the remains of uh, a completely moribund uranium mining industry. It used to, during the Cold War and uh, early the uh, development of nuclear power was a very busy place. Uh, the Colorado Plateau is very rich in uranium that volcanic action brought up from the core of the Earth's, you know, mantle. And um, a, a typical, uh, I'm sure a lot of you will be, would be familiar with the landscape of the Colorado Plateau, which is rugged and beautiful and contains things like the Grand Canyon. Um, Next slide, please. That's the Colorado Plateau, and that's, uh, you know, the kind of place that they would bring uranium out of. But they're not doing it. They're, uh, uranium mining in the U.S. is virtually shut down. I heard there are about 121 uranium miners actually doing mining, uh, and it's a kind of thing called in situ leaching, where they just uh, take water out of old mines uh, and take their uranium out of that water. Okay, so, uh, and there's some different types of uranium. This is a uranium refinery that we visited that was the biggest refinery of uh, yellow cake in the, or maker, you know, producer of yellow cake in the free world in its heyday. Uh, and it was being dismantled when we visited. And now, if you go there, there's no trace of it. It's been completely torn down and uh, the soil has been planted and uh, the tailings piles, which were once huge, have been kind of graded and smoothed out and capped and stabilized. Uh, so, the, you know, new refineries will have to be built if mining resumes. So the ore was uh, trucked uh, from here, and by the way, one truckload of uranium ore contains this uh, equivalent energy of one million Pound, uh, tons of coal. Uh, it was taken to, the ore was taken to a plant where uh, the yellow, I mean, not the ore, the yellow cake was taken to a plant where it was turned into uh, gas through chemical uh, processes. And then uh, that gas was sent to uh, an enrichment plant uh, to create, uh, to produce more to isolate out more uranium-235 from the other isotopes. Uranium for nuclear fuel uh, has been enriched to 4%. So uh, one of those pellets, like you saw in the earlier picture, has 4% uh, U-235, which is the fissile uh, isotope. To enrich for a bomb, you would need to enrich it 90%, which is why uh, you can never have a nuclear plant explode atomically, no matter how hard you try to make that happen. It can't, it's not possible. So uh, this is a, the pellets go into fuel rods, and you can get an idea of the size of a fuel rod from the hand there. And the fuel rods then are put into a fuel assembly, uh, which they're just bundled together. And then that fuel assembly winds up in a uh, reactor core. This is a research reactor core, and uh, here's a plug for research reactors. They're responsible for uh, making medical isotopes, for, among other things, and uh, those isotopes and diagnostic and therapeutic radiation save millions of lives annually. 
Did you want to say something about the... Uh, no, I okay. was just showing the top of a fuel bundle. You saw an earlier one, and then this is where it sets in, in the reactor itself. Um, then we have a plant reactor core, and it's hard to tell from the picture what, how big that is, but it's uh, surprisingly small. A reactor core is about 12 feet in diameter and 12 feet tall. So it could fit in a kitchen in Menlo Park or Palo Alto. Gwen, just one other thought. Each one of these little squares is the top of one of those fuel bundles that you saw earlier. And then uh, this is Oconee Nuclear Station in South Carolina uh, we visited. Uh, it's in a very uh, wooded, it's surrounded by woods and uh, big lake and a dam that uh, Duke Energy made. The uh, cylinders you see in the back there are uh, the, where the reactors are in the containment buildings. And we'll get to that in a minute. In the foreground is the turbine building, which is a gigantic uh, building uh, with a floor so clean you really could eat off of it, as they were proud of pointing out. Um, Okay, Oconee is uh, a phenomenal plant, but it's just a typical one, too. The amount of electricity generated in a day, a week, or a year is measured in kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. Oconee recently became the first nuclear station in the country to generate 500 million megawatt hours of electricity, enough power to supply electricity for 20 years uh, to every house in South Carolina. That's two million households. Uh, and they, Oconee did all this, taking up less than a square mile. So keep that in mind. Uh, the environmental footprint of a nuclear plant is really small compared to the power it puts out. So, okay, that the the white cylinders I pointed out to you in the, photog the photograph of the uh, Oconee plant, here's what they look like inside, which you, we've already seen this. That's, here's the inside. And note that the reactor core is below ground. Um, and how, how about the spent fuel from Oconee? Uh, First of all, it's, we know we, it produced a, all that energy with emitting virtually no greenhouse gases. All the spent fuel generated by one of Oconee's reactors in a single year, about 25 tons, could fit in the bed of Rip's pickup truck. The annual total of spent fuel from all of our 104 power reactors comes to about 2,000 tons. And how does this compare to coal combustion? Uranium yields pound for pound the greatest amount of energy of any fuel we have. Yeah, but what about safety? A nuclear plant, as I said, can never explode atomically. And I didn't know that for quite a while. And so Rip and I would have conversations, and I kept thinking, yeah, but you know, one of those things could blow. But no, they can't. Um, this is, uh, we visited Argonne West, which is now merged with Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, anyway, it's all called Idaho National Laboratory, but at that time it was called Argonne, where a lot of pioneering of reactors was done in uh, the 50s, 60s. Uh, they took reactors past their limits to find out just what it took to create meltdowns. and. Uh, they figured out the fuel configuration and all kinds of important things about uh, that, that are used worldwide now. Uh, came from places, uh, labs like this one. Uh, note the containment building. It's a pressurized dome to, so that uh, if anything happened, uh, if there was some kind of uh, release of radiation inside the building, radioactive material, it would the air would go flow into the dome, not out. Um, and no, notice also that the turbine building is separate from the reactor. There was a, uh, an uproar of a minor kind about a problem in, uh, with the turbine at, at a, the reactor in Vermont, the power plant in Vermont, 
as if this was a terrible thing that was just proof that nuclear power didn't work. But the turbines are in a separate building. They don't have anything really to do with the nuclear part. They just turn, you know, the steam just turns the turbines. Uh, so back to that pressurized water reactor diagram again. Note the size of the containment relative to the reactor core. And uh, as I said, the core is underground. Uh, the, reactor, uh, the reactor buildings at Oconee are each 19 stories high, uh, but 12 of those stories are underground. The reactors are anchored at the bottom in bedrock, uh, 100 feet below the surface to provide natural shielding. The core is enclosed by a large carbon steel vessel with a thick uh, steel liner and walls of dense concrete about five inches thick. And remember, concrete stops radiation. This concrete vessel, in turn, sits within the containment building, which is made of a shell of steel covered with four to six feet of concrete, reinforced with steel bars and negatively pressurized, as I said before. They can contain any explosion or leak. And in the case of Three Mile Island, definitely did. Anyone entering has to pass through an airlock. This, uh, of course, we did not get in a containment building uh, at Oconee or the other nuclear plant we visited on our tour. This is in, at Argonne at this uh, f former uh, reactor, you know, what, where a reactor was formerly tested and so on. It's been cleaned up. And so we could walk into the building, go through the airlock, take pictures of the airlock door and all of that uh, with no concern about radioactivity. Uh, and you can see how, just how thick that door is. Um, uh, there have been two partial core meltdowns in the history of commercial or civilian nuclear power. Um, the containment at Three Mile Island prevented the escape of radioactive material and no one was hurt. Um, I, I couldn't believe it um, when I heard, uh, when Rip told me that uh, the death toll from Chernobyl was very small. And an, actually, uh, in one month in the United States, coal killed more people by far than were killed in the Chernobyl incident. Uh, there have been a 60 deaths uh, that, c that can be directly attributed to Chernobyl. Most of them were uh, the emergency workers the firefighters, and nine have been, unfortunately, uh, children uh, who got thyroid cancer that wasn't treated, and that was completely, uh, they, if they had been given potassium iodide pills, there would have been no problem with thyroid cancer. In Poland and other areas that were exposed to radiation from Chernobyl, where people were given potassium iodide, there was no problem. It, potassium iodide blocks the uptake to the thyroid of radioactive iodine. Um, all U.S. nuclear plants have to have containment. Chernobyl had no containment. That is why Chernobyl is such a bad thing that happened. It was completely unnecessary. If it had had containment, it would have been another Three Mile Island. Uh, there are details about the design and everything, but that's basically the bottom line on Chernobyl. Uh, all the U.S. nuclear plants have to have containment and they have to have backup uh, provisions for water, keeping water supplied to the reactor to keep it cool, and uh, backup electrical systems in case of a power failure of some kind. Okay, uh, the other thing you see at a nuclear plant, uh, or don't see in our case, uh, they didn't want us to see that, uh, was the subterranean spent fuel pool. It's, by the way, it's for security reasons uh, that they didn't want us to. Um, we did get to see a spent, f after a lot of uh, security clearance and all of that stuff, we got to see a spent fuel pool at the Idaho National Lab and to see people working with uh, spent fuel there and walk along the pool. Um, and perfectly safely, by the way. There, these pools are subterranean, so... Uh, Again, they would present a very difficult target for any terrorist who wanted to try to crash a plane into what is, in effect, a swimming pool. 
uh, and it, people worry, what if terrorists stole spent nuclear fuel? Well, they would just die immediately because it's so radioactive. If they had a, and they'd need to get big cranes to load it onto a van uh, with specially reinforced axles, and then they'd need to get out of the nuclear plant without anyone noticing, and uh, they're very well-guarded plants, and I, I just don't think, uh, you, you know, a terrorist with a brain would try that. Then you have, uh, again, people worry about planes flying into nuclear plants. Just looking at this graphic will tell you why it wouldn't work very well. Rip told me, uh, Rip was uh, in charge, during 9-11, you were in charge of, one of your jobs was counterterrorism at Sandy National Labs, and so I was calling him every two minutes about disaster scenarios. And he said the World Trade Center and the Pentagon are as made of paper in comparison to what a nuclear plant is made of. So uh, a plane would just pancake against uh, that, a structure like that and did, in fact, at a test at Sandia. Um, okay, so um, nuclear plants are very safety conscious. We were nagged, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, with a by overprotective grandma type people the whole time we were there and we had to wear a special protective gear and we had to be wanded and um, we had to be, um, uh, we had to fasten our seat belts if we drove from one, the turbine building to the reactor building or whatever. They are uh, very, very safety conscious and in fact they have a, an extremely low accident rate uh, and I believe it was OSHA uh, uh, discovered that uh, you're actually at greater risk for an accident working in real estate than in nuclear plants. Uh, so this is a gamma ray counter at, the, at Argonne West. Uh, we had been in a fuel processing facility, reprocessing. And, um, when you enter and exit these plants, you're always checked for excess radiation, which is another reason a terrorist couldn't disguise himself as a nuclear tourist and just put some radioactive material in his pocket and slip out and then do damage with it. Um, couldn't happen. So I was quite satisfied by this point that nuclear plants were um, operated safely, uh, we also visited coal-fired plant, which was, you know, meeting the standards that coal-fired plants are expected to meet, especially given that the regulations tend to be written by the coal industry. And uh, it's the only time I saw Rip uh, looking nervous in the whole nuclear tour uh, because of leaky pipes and uh, stuff that would never be permitted in a nuclear f facility. Okay, so, um, and uh, uh, just to make sure that I didn't pick up any radiation on that part of the tour, uh, after it ended, I had a whole body scan with the National Institutes of Health, state-of-the-art uh, gamma ray detector, whole body, no excess radiation found. All right, very well, but what about the waste from making electricity? I ask that question a lot. And uh, since Rip is an expert on nuclear waste disposal, uh, I learned a lot from him about it. Everyone always asks about the waste. I now say, uh, when people bring up the stag the nuclear waste is just it's a staggering quantity and we don't know what to do with it. I now say, yeah, but what about fossil fuel waste and its lethal components? This is a slurry dam at a coal processing operation where they cut off the top of a mountain in Appalachia. And those slurry dams sometimes break and the toxic waste gets into the water supply in a big way. That happened in Kentucky. Um, this is the beautiful Four Corners area and these are huge coal-fired plants that uh, you can see the plume uh, I've flown over, sometimes the plume goes for just tens, hundreds of miles. Uh, it's a huge operation. 
and um, you begin to realize that fossil fuel waste is not stored in a uh, it's not sequestered and stored in an underground repository. It's stored in our tissues, in the air, in the water, in the soil. And by the way, it produces uh, low dose radiation. If you're concerned about radiation, you should be fighting coal plants because uh, you get more exposure from a coal fired plant. Uh, the Four Corners plants ex would expose you to four millirem a year. Uh, and Remember, nuclear plant, 0 0.009 millirem a year. You can be pretty sure none of us will ever encounter spent nuclear fuel in our lifetimes. It took some doing for us to even get a glimpse of it at, in, at the Idaho National Laboratory. As for the quantity of spent nuclear fuel, that's how much has been produced in 50 years of commercial power. 77,000 tons. That's about one-tenth of what one big coal-fired plant can produce in one day. Those 77,000 tons could all fit in a big Target or Best Buy store with room left over. Now, most of the people, uh, you know, when I would come back from these nuclear excursions uh, and tell about things, were surprised to learn that the United States already has a successfully operating deep geologic nuclear waste repository. It only stores defense waste at this point, but tests show it could store spent nuclear fuel too. RIP led the risk assessment team that got this site, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, certified by the Environmental Protection Agency. So RIP, can nuclear waste be safely stored? It sure can. Uh, the WIP program was a wonderful program, and it's been operating for some, quite some time. I know we're running a little bit long, so what I'm going to do is just quickly pop through a bunch of slides that shows you some of the operations that are occurring at WIP right now, and then during the question and answer, if there are other information that you would like, uh, uh, we can come back to it, because I do enjoy t talking about WIP. I can talk to you all night about it. Okay, next slide. This is, whoop, you went past one. That's uh, a true pack being carrying uh, nuclear waste from somewhere like Idaho to Carlsbad, which is southeastern New Mexico. The three barrels, which you saw in there, and here they are again, each contain 14 uh, barrels, 55 gallon drums of waste. And this guy is swabbing the barrels to check and see if there's any contamination before it's taken into the whip site. This is the waste that is in those barrels, and you can see it's a mock-up, of course. There's lab coats, there's paper towels, there's uh, uh, lab wear, there's uh, resins, there's junk. That's what's being put there. Next slide. I won't go through this uh, slide at all, but it was opened in 1999, and there has been no accidents to date. And New Mexicans are uh, at peace with it, and mm -hmm. the local people in Carlsbad, New Mexico, the nearest city, love it. They love it. Okay, this is the design in, in pictorial format. The place where you saw the truck being scanned for radioactivity, this is the receiving dock. There are four shafts that go down from the surface a half a mile and the shavs penetrate rock for about uh, a thousand feet, and then the rest of the time it's bedded salt. The haulage ways here are for taking uh, waste to the repository rooms. These are the rooms. Each room is, is uh, uh, about 100 meters long and 30 meters wide. This is the... Uh, Corer that's cutting the salt to make the, the rooms. And you can see the teeth there. You can see where it's chewed up the room. Salt mines very easily. Next slide. The drums that are being put in, in the whip room r right now, and you can see that they've got some support members in the, in the ceiling just because salt is like silly putty and it tends to creep. That's why salt's a good place to put the waste. In a few 
tens to 100 years, the salt will creep in both from the ceiling, the floor, and the sides, and in, in, in case all of this waste in a salt a cocoon. And then finally, when the, whole, when the repository is full, the shafts are sealed, there will be some kind of a marker system. We had a marker study to, to try to tell future uh, societies that there was danger underground and don't drill here or don't dig here. And this is one of the pictures they have. Uh, nuclear plants are moving spent fuel from uh, pools after the f fuel cools down to interim storage in air-cooled dry casks of thick concrete. The nuclear industry pays one-tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour, which goes into a waste repository fund no U.S. taxpayer dollars are collected to pay for commercial nuclear waste. This fund is financing the study to determine the feasibility of a central repository in Nevada at the Nevada test site. And this is on top of Yucca Mountain, um, looking toward uh, a, a, a place where a lot of bomb craters are from atomic explosions. Over 900 have taken place uh, at the Nevada test site. It's a 5,000 mile, uh, square mile reservation surrounded by other federal land. The decision to put a waste repository at Yucca Mountain was mainly a political one. The land was federally owned. A tunnel has been bored five miles into the granite tuff of the mountain and studies are being conducted there. RIP has been participating in an internal peer review of the science of Yucca Mountain Project. And this is a, a schematic. Uh, this is just, uh, it's, everything is at the conceptual stage with Yucca Mountain in terms of how exactly the waste is gonna be put in there. They're looking at all kinds of possibilities. This is one system that's uh, uh, a po possible way they'll do it. Uh, as I said earlier, WIP was wanted by the people in Carlsbad and has been accepted by the people of New Mexico. Uh, even the anti-nuclear uh, guys in New Mexico grudgingly admit that WIP is safer than they thought it was going to be. But the state of Nevada does not want a, a repository, so there are ongoing court battles. Every single person I talked to about Yucca Mountain who's associated with the project said, the problems are political, not technical. Okay, this is it. In May 2007, the International Panel, on, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's draft report stated that only a concerted action requiring a huge monetary investment and a profound change in policy can avert a climate collapse, and that intervention must be accomplished by 2020. The IP. CC recommended a variety of interventions uh, of all kinds, hybrid cars, uh, carbon capture, nuclear power. And the UN expects a large increase in human fatalities, especially in poor countries, as microclimates disappear and whole ecological systems give way. Will the civilization that has been elaborated for hundreds of generations withstand the greatest challenge it has ever faced? Ultimately, the whole nuclear tour led me to that question. It's clear that the benefits of nuclear power far outweigh the risks. And these, I'm gonna, if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna read them aloud because this is really, these are all the things that changed my mind about nuclear power and led me to be sitting up here today telling you uh, why I think it's so important that we really take a good look at nuclear power. Uranium is very energy dense. A small quantity equals a huge amount of power. There are huge reserves of uranium in geopolitically favorable spots. Fuel can be recycled many times. Only 2% is used if the fuel is ta just takes one trip through the reactor. Uh, mature, it's a mature technology. Uh, the new reactor designs, uh, there are many, uh, and prototypes show that you can have a reactor that consumes 
its own waste. You can produce hydrogen on a large scale. There's a project going on in Idaho right now uh, with a reactor like that. Um, U.S. reactors operate at over 95% capacity. No other system of energy generation can claim that kind of capacity. Over 12,000 reactor years have been passed in safety. As I said, a nuclear plant has a very small environmental footprint, uh, and nuclear plant radiations are, uh, radiation emissions are less than you get from eating a banana a year. Um, the lowest environmental impact of any large-scale energy source. And as I said before, the biggest displacer of greenhouse gases on the planet. Uh, a Harvard-MIT study uh, suggests that a tripling of the world's 440 reactors would result in a 25% reduction in greenhouse gases. Uh, Rip one day told me a story about a man uh, who was uh, warned about a flood. Uh, Rip, would you tell the story? Yes, this is kind of an old, old joke, but I hope you'll bear with me. There was a man that got caught up in a flood, and uh, the police came by his house and said, you better evacuate. And God, he said, God will save me. And then the water rose up a ways, and a boat come by, and the boat said, do you want us to, to save you? And he said, no, God will save me. The water got to the top of the roof, and a helicopter come by, and he, they said, you want, me to, you want us to save you? And he said, no, God will save me. Well, the man drowned. And when he arrived at St. Peter's, uh, the pearly gates where St. Peter was, he said, why didn't you uh, save me? And St. Peter said, I sent a policeman, a boat, and a helicopter. You are ignored them all. Well, uh, one day God could very well say, I gave you the brainiest people, ladies and, and men. I gave you an understanding of radioactive decay. I gave you enough uranium and thorium to last you thousands of years. I gave you the knowledge and how to harness the energy so it wouldn't harm the environment or you while you were using it. What else do you want? Well, I think tonight we have skimmed the top of many of the arguments for nuclear energy. If you want to learn more about it, read the book. I just Thanks, want to guys. say, I do want to know more about it. Just, I have one last line. The punchline oh, is: good. the power to save our world does not lie in rocks, rivers, wind, or sunshine. It lies in each of us. Well, the questions really fall into some themes, um, <laughs> as you might imagine. There's one from Kevin Bial. Where are you, Kevin? Right here. Uh, in the long emergency, uh, Howard Kunstler, uh, he's actually one of the environmentalists who's hard over for nuclear, sort of interesting. It states that the Earth holds only 150 years worth of nuclear fuel. How does this play into long-term plans for nuclear energy usage? Please comment on uranium mining, says Michael P. Uh, and the reliability of uranium as a fuel long into the future. I've heard predictions of peak uranium production around 2030 to 2040. Um, and Susan says, yeah, but, say dramatic need leads uh, for energy leads to huge demand and growth in the nuclear energy industry. That means mining uranium in far greater quantities than in the past. What's the danger of that? What's the degradation of the geographical, geological sites? And is uranium uh, finite or how long will the supply last? So, there, and I've heard this from a lot of times, I'm sure you have. What, what's the uranium supply? Situation. You want to take the first cut, Gwen? Well, Rip can talk to you about how much uranium and thorium there is on the Earth and how we can, we basically have an indefinite supply because it can be reprocessed. Uh, they now, uh, you know, they mix uh, one of the waste products of uh, in spent nuclear fuel is plutonium, but it can be burned as a fuel. So. The French now, uh, when they reprocess fuel, they mix that plutonium back, you know, they blend it down with um, depleted uranium and, 
you know, create fuel. So it's basically, a, a, you know, recyclable, sustainable. I mean, there are some people in the nu nuclear world consider nuclear power sustainable, and they make a good case for that. And if we just ran out of every last uh, atom of uranium on the planet, we could go to thorium, which is even more abundant than uranium and has some uh, benefits. For example, it's a very, uh, it's more proliferation proof. Um, in terms of mining, uh, so I, I don't think there's peak uranium. I, I don't believe that because of when the, we talked to the mining, uh, former chairman of the mining commission in New Mexico, and he was talking about the huge reserves of good quality ore just in New Mexico. That, you know, since the, uh, uranium, the bottom dropped out of the uranium market, when we were there in 2002, I think it was, uh, uranium was $7 a pound, and this summer it was up to something like $134 a pound. And what Terry uh, Fletcher uh, said to us that when we talked to him in New Mexico was, um, just uh, if uh, the price is right, there's endless amounts of uranium to be mined. And they, they haven't even, they've stopped prospecting. So there's probably uranium that hasn't even been found. So I just don't think that's a problem. And in terms of uh, mining, the regulations today uh, for uranium mining are much different from during the uranium booms. And in terms of miner safety, once they discovered that radon was causing lung cancer rates to go up among miners, they started ventilating the mines so that they're like wind tunnels now. Uh, or they, I mean, they, they're, they're no, actually, they became like wind tunnels. I need to use the past tense because I, I don't believe there's much, if any, hard rock uranium mining going on uh, right now. But, uh, and again, uh, smokers, got higher rates of lung cancer uh, if, uh, because of the interaction. There's a synergy of some kind between uh, radon and the um, uh, radioisotopes in cigarette smoke. So uh, miners would be at no greater risk today from mining uranium than they... Mining, mining is a risky business. Uh, just ask a coal miner about that. Uh, also, a miner, uh, a uranium miner takes out in one day uh, the same amount of energy uh, containing ore as a coal miner takes out in a month. So the quantity of coal that has to be mined to light these light bulbs uh, in this beautiful room is so far greater than the quantity of uranium that has to be mined that there's just no comparison. Uh, I've got a question on reprocessing relating to that, which is uh, sort of at both ends of the, the you know, Right now, we're mining uh, Soviet nuclear weapons. I and understand ours. we are not yet, but we'll move on to mining uh, U.S. nuclear weapons. Is that no, right? we're starting to mine. So there's a lot of well. plutonium there to degrade down to fuel. Um, you've been dealing now with the Yucca Mountain, and so you're looking at the quantities of waste, mostly in these dry cask storage, some of them still in the pools, which is it true you swam in one of those pools? Well, not really. Uh, <laughs> it was worse than that. <laughs> Way back when, when I was uh, bulletproof and 10 feet tall, one of the research reactors at Sandia Labs, um, which was a flash reactor, uh, they couldn't get some of the bolts at the top of the, spin, uh, of the fuel bundles loose, and uh, two of us negotiated uh, and dived down into the reactor and unbolted the bolts because it was quicker and easier. And we had Geiger counters and such in there so that we knew that we weren't getting any higher radiation and we were standing out on the, sh on the edge of the pool. But it was rather interesting to do. Rip is a Those certified diver. Don't try this at home. Yeah. Why not? It's the next bungee jumping. One of the... <laughs> Bungee jumping is not as safe. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more thought on the, the first question. If you look how oil exploration has occurred, every time we get really short on oil, somebody comes up with a brand new find on 
of a major oil uh, uh, cache. If and when we get into the, into the need for uranium, we have only started to prospect for the uranium. We're going to find it everywhere. And it is in the ocean waters, too. You can get it out of the ocean water. There's lots and lots of it there. Well, just in terms of the stuff which is in the dry cast storage and the, the, the once-through process that we do in the U.S. that I guess almost nobody else in the world does, can we take that and reprocess it if we resume reprocessing of uh, how much juice is, is in that so-called spent fuel? It's very easy to do, to, to take the spent fuel and reprocess it. In fact, the older the spent fuel is, the less radioactive it is, and therefore the, the easier it is to run it through the Purex process or whatever the pro new process will be. So what would be the volume reduction of, say, the, Suppose we do as we're planning now and put all of the spent fuel on a once through into Yucca Mountain. Uh, if we didn't do that, since none of it's in there yet, but reprocessed all of it and put the, the waste that's left over from reprocessing and put it in, in the Yucca Mountain, what's the difference in volume? Oh, it's a, a huge volume reduction because you, if you put in the spent fuel bundles, you're putting in mainly air volume or volume mm -hmm. to begin with. And then in addition to that, what you're putting in, if you put in the fuel bundle, is you're putting in all of the zirconium rod coatings. So even if you didn't reprocess, but you just separated out the uranium pellets, it would be hard to do, but if you did, you would be cutting down your volume by over 50, 60%. Then if you process and save the uranium and the plutonium and only had the fission fragments, and solidified them in, say, a glass log, which is what people are suggesting to do now. Even with the increase of the volume you would need for the glass to, to keep it, the, the radionuclides that you don't want dissolved in the glass, you would increase it maybe to 20% of the volume you started with. Well, so suppose, it's a, I mean, <clears throat> Sagebrush Rebellion in Nevada, we're very familiar with Nevada and the Long Now <laughs> Foundation because we're talking about putting a clock on one of their mountains. That's why I went to Yucca Mountain, is not to think about nuclear, but to think about holes and mountains in Nevada. And uh, in Nevada, is, the Sagebrush Rebellion is alive and well in terms of uh, them not wanting feds putting uh, nuclear waste in their mountain. So suppose Harry Reid, uh, senator, you know, head of the Senate now, uh, is successful in heading that off for a good long time. Could we put the waste in your whip in New Mexico? The They'd have to change some rules, I yes, guess. We, politically, it would be quite difficult. Technically, when we were studying whether it was safe to put transuranic, which is what was put in, what is being put in WIP right now, if we wanted to put spent fuel, we carried out many spent fuel simulation studies hmm. where we put uh, containers that were the size of, a, of several fuel bundles into the wall with, with electric heaters and heated them up for, for many, many, uh, year, uh, many, many months and saw the, re, the response of the salt to that heating. And it turns out it was very, very good. Remember the National Academy way back when, when they were first asked to look at what to do with nuclear waste or spent fuel, the National Academy said, put it in salt because it has a higher thermal conductivity, gets rid of the heat, it has a, a, a capability of acting like city putty, silly putty, and in, comp in, in, in tombing. I understand the, the ceilings sort of the ceilings, sway down and The get ceilings weird. come down. In fact, huh? part of the problem with operating WHIP is the haulage ways, which has to be open while you fill up all the rooms, do the same thing. Uh -huh. The roofs come in and the sides come in, and so they have to keep mining the walls and ceilings to keep it open while they fill up the, the individual rooms. Well, you're the technical guy. If it was not a political issue, would you rather put our nuclear energy waste in WIP or in Yucca Mountain? The first thing I would do was make sure that I saved the 98% of the energy that was in the spent fuel so I'd reprocess it and then uh, you could put it in either place. Uh, from what I can tell from the review that I have done on Yucca Mountain, 
the mountain is a good mountain and it will protect uh, mankind from uh, the fishing fragments for as long as needed. But it's a major political problem. What do you think of the science that's gone on there for the last 30 years? There's been some very good science uh, at the Yucca Mountain. And there's been some questionable science. And there's been some politics that have made the scientists look bad when they were really only grumping about, I really don't want to do this additional <laughs> quality assurance. <laughs> it's a boring mountain, I have to say. Yes, it is. Uh, Alexander Rose rightly raises you know, so much of what our discussion is about the U.S. And the U.S. actually is the, the largest national producer of nuclear power in the world. But still, most of the, the demand that's coming is in the world. Alexander Rose uh, asks, since most of the new power generation is coming from developing nations, are, are we going to give nuclear technology to them? What about Brazil, Indonesia, places like that? We're giving some to India now, I understand. They're, they're planning to expand by tenfold what they have. Yeah, this, this is, uh, I'm sorry Richard Rhodes isn't here tonight because this is his beat, but um, uh, this is, uh, this is gonna have to be done in an intelligent way, I think, and uh, based on what I know. Uh, and there are, are several um, prospects here. One is to have an international consortium that controls the mm -hmm. spent fuel and, and lease, basically leases the fuel and takes it back and reprocesses it so that you don't have countries with their own uranium enrichment plants. You can't make a nuclear weapon from a nuclear power plant, but if you just have a uranium enrichment plant, you can enrich all the uranium you want. So. Uh, I, it, this, this is tricky. Uh, another thing is that uh, Dick Rhodes wrote a wonderful piece called The Genie is Out of the Bottle, which is in fact the case that sooner or later people can figure out that once you know the secret of radioactive decay producing energy, you can come up with the technology to harness that. And so, um, I, th I think, uh, you know, the, the idea of tripling the number of reactors, we're going to have more reactors, and we have to have all kinds of international, um, as Stuart was saying earlier, uh, before the, the talk, global bureaucrats who go around and just inspect and inspect and inspect the way the International Atomic Energy Agency does to make sure people aren't pulling stuff like they were in North Korea. Now they've really sat on... North Korea and things seem to be calming down there. So I don't know if that answers the question. I'd well, like one to. The, one of the speakers we had in this series was Richard Rockefeller, and I happened to go to his wedding uh, a couple months ago in Maine, and he's been very much involved with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and their CEO is, it turns out, a diplomat who engages in all sorts of things. One of them is dealing with Iran. Everybody's major concern these days, besides North Korea, in terms of proliferation, is what if, you know, is Iran, what's Iran doing with all of this nuclear energy? They've got all that oil, they must be just building a bomb. And two things. One is, they really need the nuclear energy, it turns out, and in some ways we would all be glad if they did, because it takes some of the pressure off oil and less greenhouse gas and so on. But what about the bomb aspect? And uh, what the Rockefeller Brothers Fund is on the brink of getting is an agreement for exactly this kind of basically offshore reprocessing of the fuel. So they're not doing reprocessing that might enrich it all the way toward weapons grade. It's being done outside. They basically rent the service. And uh, the sticking point at this point in the negotiations is uh, will the plant that does that be inside the borders of Iran or not? And Iran says, well, of course it will. And some of the other people are saying, that's not a sincere enough answer. <laughs> Uh, it needs to be outside the borders of Iran. So that's the, the stage they're at with that one. I'm sorry. I guess I'd like to approach your question, or the answer to your question in a little bit different way. I've studied global warming and its effects, as I indicated earlier, for many, many years. Hmm. And I think we're heading at about 90 miles an hour for, at a very, very, very big brick wall. And if we don't come up with some other way to stop it or slow it down, 
we're going to be splattered all over the wall. And it, when, we, when you come to developing nations, they need energy. We can either force them to burn fossil fuels, or we can come up with some way that we can give them the nuclear energy, that they, or give them the energy they need through the nuclear process, and protect the proliferation. And I think in the long term, we only have one answer to that. We've got to some way come up with, a, with giving them energy through the nuclear option, and then protecting for proliferation uh, by reprocessing somewhere offshore or just bringing the fuel back and processing it at, in one of the countries, as France does now with Japan. Well, what's the, you take climate change very seriously. I do. And uh, your sense of urgency sounds strong. One of the critiques of nuclear energy is that there's this huge lead time to get a plant on, you know, get it through the process, licensed, funded, built, finally online. And uh, to do it at the scale you're talking about, to actually deal with the massiveness of the problem we're talking about, is do the time frames match? Or do we basically get you know, sufficient nukes, but then it's too late? I think that if we tomorrow started a major process, both in the United States and in the developing countries, of formalizing a nuclear process, meaning one kind of a reactor where you could go, when, when you trained the people, they could go to any one reactor, any of a, a number of reactors, and fix the reactor the same way, rather than every single reactor, and, and this is an over, overstatement, but every single reactor we have now, the reactor technicians have to go in and say, oh, now this is a left-handed nut, this is a right-handed <laughs> nut, this is not a nut, it's a clip. And, and so it, it makes the, the costliness of, of treating those reactors very, very, very high. And it makes the safety less if each time you have to go in and say, geez, I don't know whether I want to turn this right or left. It means that you have added some level of uncertainty on the safety of that reactor. So there's a lot of steps that have to be done. But if we don't start now, we're going to be in real trouble. We're already seeing, as an oceanographer now, the coastal areas changing pH by a half a pH unit. Now, why is it coastal? Because the currents in the coast, onto the, from the shore to the continent, edge of the continental shelf, that's where the water is continuously stirred from top, bottom to top. And that's changing pH units as we speak. Here's a question from Eric Saxby, getting down to practicalities. Eric? How does the industry for acquiring nuclear, nuclear fuel, I almost did a Bush's in there, nuclear, did you hear it? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Nuclear fuel, uh, mining, transport, all this stuff, compare with fossil fuels with regard to greenhouse gas emission and environmental pollution. Now, there's the process all the stuff that happens before you get the, the, you know, the, from the ground to the ore, to the refinery, to the reactor. Is that using a lot of fossil fuel? Uh, no. Uh, we saw it. Marcia, can you bring up that ch uh, the greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions, the comparative emissions life cycle? While you search, I'll ask another no. question from okay. Tom. Are there sufficient experienced nuclear scientists and engineers to support a massive expansion in nuclear power? No. <laughs> Former uh, Soviet so ones. So that's the limited resource, not uranium, it's engineers. One of the, the more critical resources is indeed nuclear engineers that know how to run reactors. In this and country, in the world, where? In, in, in the world, but for sure in the United States. It takes, I don't know whether you've any of you have looked at the training in a nuclear reactor uh, driver, if you want to call him, uh, goes through, but it is horrendous. They go through psychological tests, they go through physical tests, they go through all kinds of tests, and, and they, they train in simulators more than the pilots that you guys fly in airplanes do. Uh, I'll vouch for this, by the way. I get invited to speak at gatherings of nuclear industry people because um, 
my message to them is, you're all environmentalists now, here's how to act green. <laughs> and they jump and they haven't seen Al Gore's movie and all this kind of stuff. But when I look at an audience of oh, these characters, they're all old farts <laughs> and busy retiring. And uh, when they talk to me afterwards, it's, where are we going to get the young people? And I said, well, you know, I'll help you get the young people, but one, you got to hire them, two, you got to give them a lot of power early on, and three, they're probably going to, if they come there now, they're going to be green. And they're going to have a green agenda, and you best get used to that. But whether that's really going to happen, I don't know. I hear that some of the engineering schools, there is, Peter Schwartz is nodding his head, that there are people going to nuclear engineering now, that it's hip again, yep. and uh, we'll see what happens. But again, there's a lag time there. There's a lag time. But the longer we wait, the worse the well, Everybody else wants to know, this one is from uh, Michael Ovadia. Uh, what's the worst case for, say, a uh, plant meltdown, uh, spent nuclear fuel being released in the environment over thousands of years, um, a terrorist attack? I mean, as a risk guy, you're always looking at what can go wrong. What can go wrong? Okay. Well, he's a risk guy, but, and so I'll, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, but I just want to say, we did have the worst of the worst of the worst happen in Chernobyl. It was the worst uh, plant design. It was the uh, run by a political hack, who, and they decided to do an experiment uh, that involved cutting off the water, the coolant water to the reactor core. Uh, the channels in the graphite, um, the re reactor was made of graphite, and if it gets hot enough, graphite burns, and the channels sucked air as a, uh, there was a fire, it sucked more air down and created more of a fire. The weather pattern that day was very bad. Um, the Soviets, uh, you know, didn't want to, anyone to find out about this accident, so they were trying to cover it up. So they didn't want to evacuate people. And um, uh, the plume, uh, there was no containment. So uh, that, we, we know what the worst case scenario looks like, which is a combination of terrible bureaucracy and politics, bad design, uh, and very poor safety engineering. Uh, the, and RIP, if you can talk about the kind of risk assessment that went into reactor design, uh, nuclear plant design in the United States, and why all the reactors in the United States have containment buildings. Yeah, the, uh, to add, before I do that, to add to what Gwen said, if we look at the two accidents, the Chernobyl accident and the Three Mile Island accident, both of those resulted from someone who was less than adequately trained turning off the water. And that's equivalent <laughs> to saying, to a fireman who is trying to fight a, a three-alarm fire, hey, turn off the water. Fight the fire without water. You can't do it. Almost all of that kind of activity now has been modified through both computers and training to the point where there is no way that the water can be shut off. In the Three Mile Island, the uh, about half of the core melted and melted through the bottom of the reactor vessel, the little one in the center, but the containment vessel contained all of it, all of the radionuclides, and when they finally went in, most of the radionuclides that were released were plated out on the inside of the, the concrete shell, and uh, nothing got out. There was a little bit got out, and that was when they decided that, that the zirconium had gotten hot enough to react with the water and generate hydrogen. Then they worried about a hydrogen explosion, and so they decided that rather than having a hydrogen explosion, which could have, maybe, could have, don't know, blown up the containment vessel, they vented the hydrogen, and in that hydrogen was a little bit of helium, which was radioactive. But the helium went out into the air, dispersed, and the dose from that helium was almost non-existent. One millirem per person in the Har Harrisburg area. If someone had left Harrisburg to get away from the dread radiation from TMI and they'd moved to Denver, they would have increased their radiation exposure sevenfold from natural background. 
you got to remember again, think, talking about Chernobyl, that was really a graphite fire. It was lit by a reactor core burning, but the main reason for there was a long dispersion of, of stuff, including smoke and radionuclides, is because the graphite was burning. They had a heck of a good charcoal. They should have roasted a, 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 a cow over it, you know. I'm being facetious here again, but, but it was really a, graphite, a steam explosion and then a graphite fire. Uh, and I, I just want to add one thing about the, and that question. There was the, and uh, what if terrorists or whatever, an accident would cause radiation for thousands of years. Uh, at Chernobyl, 21 years later, um, the wildlife in the exclusion zone around the, uh, that was totally evacuated except for some diehard Russian peasants who were doing fine, you know, living there and didn't want to move. Um, the wildlife is flourishing, um, uh, probably because humans aren't there to interfere with it. And uh, the, uh, over, uh, since the Chernobyl area is, uh, has low natural background radiation, it's a swamp with not many rocks, so if that's 100, it's about 100 millirem a year naturally. So now it's gone up to uh, something like 300 millirem a year average because of the hot, there are hot spots here and there. But if the people who were in the, uh, around, living around Chernobyl wanted to escape from radiation and they moved to Finland, they would again be increasing their radiation exposure. So you have to think when you say thousands of years, well, you, you have to put it in some kind of context, some kind of perspective. Last question, and it's a common one. Basically, the economic question is it's what Amory Lovins is always bearing down on. It's what Ralph Cavana talked about when he was in this room with Peter Schwartz several months ago. Um, and a couple questions here, one from Peter Boyer, one from Nick uh, Cizek. I'll read to Nick's version of it. If nuclear is such a good energy electricity source, why are free markets overwhelmingly choosing cogeneration and microgeneration over nuclear? Nuclear plants are only being built with strong political and economic support of centralized governments, like France. Well, um, I can tell you that um, uh, when we visited Duke Energy and uh, looked at Oconee and McGuire nuclear plants, uh, these are cash cows for the utility, and they because the startup costs for these reactors have been paid off. Af Oconee, after eight years, had paid off its costs, and electricity in the southeast is cheap and uh, has in South Carolina they haven't raised their rates since something like 1986. D uh, Duke hasn't raised it since n 1991 or something. So uh, I th one of the reasons utilities want more nuclear reactors, and they're applied, I think there's something like 34 applications, maybe heading for the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission for, to build new reactors, is because they are profitable. Uranium is low in price, and if carbon, uh, if there's ever a carbon tax, nuclear, which is already competitive with coal, will de facto become cheaper than coal. So uh, I don't, I don't uh, uh, all uh, fuel, all energy is subsidized. And um, wind farms, for example, and solar power, uh, I'm always getting things from my utility trying to get me to buy a windmill or a solar installation or whatever. These are very, uh, I can't afford it actually. <laughs> I can't, that's uh, an expensive technology for uh, you know, a writer to get behind. I'm, I'm philosophically for these renewable sources, by the way. I, it's just that in terms of uh, money, it's a deal breaker. Uh, and I think most people would rather not climb up on the roof like my father used to do and have to tinker with the solar panels to get them to work. So um, I, I'm not an economist and so on, but uh, I don't think uh, renewable energy is operating in a free market either. Denmark, Germany, it's heavily subsidized. Germany is basically paying Germans to buy windmills or to take on windmills and solar power. They're, they're paying them. So that's not, to me, like free market. 
But again, I'm not an economist, uh, and so that's well, why. As I understand it, the, the sort of like hydroelectric dams, which are also carbon dioxide free, there's huge capital costs, huge long process to get it out there. But once it's there, there's relatively quite low, in fact, operating costs. And nuclear seems to have this quality that it's, especially these big ones, uh, 1,000 megawatt and bigger. And they are getting bigger, presumably for economies of scale. So they're huge to build, but I, and my understanding is that even though the price of uranium fuel is going up, once they're built, they're pretty cheap to operate, and you say they're a cash cow. Well, if that's the case, why does the nuclear industry, who promises they're not going to fuck it up this time, they're, you know, just one more boom, please, God, are all over the government for, uh, you know, various subsidies in terms of insurance, of guarantee of loans, uh, basically drench us with money and we'll give you power. What's that about? Well, um, the Price-Anderson, I, I knew the Price-Anderson thing would come up, so I brought uh, with me, if I can find it. I hope I remembered to bring it. Well, I don't know if I did, after all. But um, nuclear power is self-insured. This is often, uh, this is one of those myths, and there may be someone in the audience who's more uh, up to speed on it, but uh, the Price-Anderson Act uh, is what compelled, uh, it set up the insurance plan for nuclear plants. Insurance pools have paid more than $200 million in claims and litigation costs since the act went into effect. They dispersed approximately $71 million of that total in claims and litigation costs related to the 1979 accident at Three Mile Island Two. The Price-Anderson Act provides no-fault insurance to benefit the public in the event of a nuclear power plant accident the Nuclear Regulatory Commission deems to be an extraordinary nuclear occurrence, in quotes. The cost of this insurance, like all the costs of nuclear-generated electricity, are borne by the industry, unlike the corresponding costs of some other power sources. Risks from hydropower mishaps, dam failure, and resultant flooding, for example, are borne directly by the public. The 1977 failure of the Teton Dam in Idaho caused $500 million in property damage, but the only compensation provided to those affected was about $200 million in low-cost government loans. Under the Price-Anderson framework, the public has paid nothing. The act has proven so successful that Congress has used it as a model for legislation to protect the public against potential losses or harm from other hazards, including faulty vaccinations, medical malpractice, and toxic waste. Uh, also, uh, back to the economic question, which is sort of part of your thing, uh, external costs. The European Union has found nuclear power's external costs regarding the environment and public health care lower than those of coal, gas, and solar power. In terms of avoidance costs to damage related to ecosystems and global warming, those of nuclear power are on a par with renewables. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.